All right, well, it's great to have everyone here today. Uh, for those of you that are online, it's good to see you as well. Um, thanks for joining us today. We've got two so far online. I'm sure there'll be more. Um, today we're on sections 111, uh, 21, and 22, which are uh, not not terribly uh, not terribly much more than what we've already done with with functions and graphing and solving, um, but they look at some of the finer aspects. I would say maybe some of the more difficult uh, aspects of the material. The first one that we'll look at is how do you deal with inequalities and graphs functions. Uh, so in section one point eleven, they ask you things like this, um, you've got one graph, right, you've got one graph, let me just draw a random little graph here, let's say it crosses at negative one, at two, and at ten, over here, this is graph one. And then we've got an entirely different graph. So this is the solid one. And we've got graph two, like this. Maybe I'll label this intersection point at four. How do we answer questions that ask, where is graph one? Less than graph two. This question of where uh, and this question of less than is a little bit odd. I think in topics like this because you know you look at this and you think it gets a picture. How can it be less than? Right. Well, it's dotted, so clearly it's less than that one. This one's solid. This one requires more chalk. So this one's always less than that one. You know, it's like that's a you know a non-informed answer there. But when you're answering questions like this, what you're really uh, answering is for what part of the domain and for what past value uh, is the y value. The first graph less than the y value of the second graph is y1 less than y2, I should say. Pretty slow. Now, when you look at graphs, what you're looking at, remember, are a bunch of coordinate pairs. This one is negative 1, 0. This one looks to be something like 4. Comma, negative three, negative. You see, at this point, the graphs intersect. So the fact the y values for both graphs are the same here. But everywhere over here, the y values for the solid line are less than the y values for this dotted line. So graph one is less than graph two here. For all of those x values. Right? So you could answer it like this the best of your knowledge from four to the left, although we can't see the end of this graph over here. From four to the left, graph one is less than. This is the gist of section 1.11. Um, and there's two problems here at the beginning that give you the graph, uh, graph one, graph two, and they ask this very question. But for everything else, they ask you to first use a graphing utility to graph the two functions and then answer the same question. So that, that's kind of lame because you're not supposed to be using the calculator in this class, which means you've got two problems, but, I'm pretty sure I gave you other questions to answer that do require graphing. So please do use graphing calculator to look at these things and then answer the question if you need. Okay. 
Um, on the test, I'll avoid putting those questions and I'll give you questions with graphs because that's what this is. This class is supposed to be about doing it without the, the graphs. Any other questions on 1.11? That's, that's really all I expected to do for that section. Yeah. So the line for graph one is what? Why did why is four? The, why is four the place that it becomes less than? Like where? What? What are you looking at in that graph? Saying like that's why it's more than greater than one. Okay. Good. I'm just looking at it, making sure I didn't make a mistake. Graph one solid. Yeah. Less than. Two dotted. Yeah, okay. So the reason I'm looking from here to the left um, uh, is I'm looking at the heights of these two things, how far above and how far below the line, this horizontal x axis that's uh, drawn in. Looking at the heights of these lines for every single x value. Okay, so let me just pick one at random. I'll pick this x value. Our test x. Okay, now let's label y1 and y2. So graph one, if I just draw a straight line here, is right here. This is y1. That's the y value for graph one. So this height, that's y1. Okay, now I'll keep continuing down. Here's y2, this height. Which one's bigger? Y1. Y1 is bigger than Y2. But I was asking Y1 less than Y2. So this test point shows me, just comparing these two heights, that Y1 is not less than Y2 for this X value. So you can sort of use different test values all along here, drawing vertical lines to determine the Y heights for both graphs. And all of the X's that give you the correct inequality, graph one less than graph two, or y one less than y two, those x values are included in your solution. When they ask for, for what x values, it is y one less than y two. So here, drop that straight line, the y values are equal to the graphs intersect. From here on to the left, the dotted line is always higher, albeit by a small amount. It's always higher than the solid line. Right? So every single one of these x values from four over is included. Hey, Professor. Yeah. Uh, some people are saying that the chalkboard on Zoom is like blurry on our end. Okay. Um, that might be the case for the, just because of the internet here. Um, let me see. I can probably move it closer and that might help us. However, uh, the internet here is touch and go, as I know, I'm sure many of you know. The recording though, after this lecture will be uploaded and that recording will be a much better definition. Okay. So I'll move this closer. Hopefully this table isn't too heavy. And I'll try to move less so that the screen is changing its picture less. Is that better at all? Yeah, it's a little better. Okay. We're going to have to deal with what we got. But again, the recording will be much better because it doesn't have to beam the image over to Zoom and then beam it back to you guys. It'll just be the native recording. Other questions? All right, the next section is uh, 112, which we're skipping. 
but 2, 1 is the one after that. And we're just looking at things called functions. Um, so the problems I picked out were 26, 34, 54, 56, 60, and 64. Let's start with 26. We have this one. So the function's name, if you will, is G. The input is a number T. And the rule for this function is T, uh, T plus two divided by T minus two. Okay. Uh, so for example, just to make a quick computation, G of two. So the function with an input of two for T what do we get then? We get two plus two over two minus two, which is a problem, right? Oh man, that's four over nothing. Gross. Can't do things like that. But we can plug in any other sort of input for this kind of function. And we are supposed to be evaluating it at negative two, two, and zero. So Let's just evaluate this spots and we'll press on. G of negative two, we can plug in negative two for T. That gives us zero over negative four. G of zero is zero plus two over zero minus two, which is negative one. I think functions are great. I think choices that you make can easily be modeled by functions. Like, for example, the temperature outside is really, it's kind of dropping, right? So today I chose to wear my pullover or whatever you call this thing, right? My wife bought it for me, it's great, comfy, my Daughters love how soft it is. But I had some decision to make this morning, and so I collected inputs. And there wasn't just one input, there was lots of them. So choice, input, temperature. Input, distance I'm going to be walking. That helps me pick my shoes. Input, comfort factor for the day. You know, how comfortable do I want to be? Input all these things. And the end result is clothing choice. Functions are great. You can use them for all sorts of things. Uh, and it doesn't have to be mathematical. It could be totally like this. Number 34 is the next one. Gets at an even more prevalent kind of function in the real world, I would say. Something called piecewise functions. Now, the very name is a compound word, piecewise. You're taking pieces and you're smacking them together and you're giving them scenarios that they take place. So, piecewise. 34. The pieces that we have are like this. React. That's the first piece. The next piece is x plus one. Next one is x minus one squared. I think piecewise functions do a really good job uh, of modeling real world things because they explicitly tell you When to do which thing? When to do which thing? Each piece rule has a specific criterion for the input. If you input a negative number, 
This is the thing you do. You multiply it by three. If you input a number bigger than two, this is what you do. You subtract one and then square it. If you input something between two and zero, this is the rule. You just add one. So piecewise functions give you the rules. And then they give you this. Usually that sometimes there's commas separating these things. Sometimes you'll see the word if. Sometimes if will be when. And sometimes it'll be as I've written it with nothing separating them except a little bit of space like in your book. And I'm noticing I forgot this. So let's answer question 34. Evaluate piecewise function defined at the values uh, below. So we're supposed to evaluate f of negative 5, f of 0, f of 1, and f of 2 and 5. Not too bad. We just need to find out which rule we're going to use in every situation. So here our input is negative five, which gives us we're using rule one. Okay, negative five satisfies negative five less than zero. It does not satisfy this or this. So negative five goes here three times. Negative five is negative 15. Zero. Right here, right? X is equal to zero. So we're going to take zero plus one. I mind, I was thinking zero. That's not right. One. One. Still this rule, right? So we're just going to add one. Two, still this rule. X is equal to two here, so we're going to add one. Five finally gets us over here, right? That five is bigger than two, so this is our rule. Subtracting one gives four. Four squared is 16. Okay. Yeah, piecewise functions I think are really, really great. Uh, really great. Very useful, very practical. Questions on piecewise functions? Can you give me a real world example from the last week? Some sort of piecewise function that you've dealt with. What do you mean? Yeah. Input time, MC preferences, breakfast, lunch, dinner. Menu for breakfast, menu for lunch, menu for supper. Yes, great. It's all over, right? Decisions are piecewise because each piece is a different decision often. It may not be numerical.
Okay, skipping way ahead to 54 now. Another part of uh, section 2.1 is to find things called the domain and the range of functions. Um, so 54. As it's looking at 5x squared. Plus 4 on a section of the uh, x axis. And I think it's between 0 and uh, 2. So, what is the domain? I hope we remember that the domain is the set of numbers that are allowed inputs. The domain is all of the x values where we can actually compute this result. Okay. Now, if, if I told us to forget all of this over here, you'd look at this and you would say, I can square any number, right? I'm not going to have any calculator errors there. I can multiply that by five, and of course, I can add four, so that's fine. So any number. I can compute this value, five x squared plus four, for any number I want. So normally, you would say all reals, right? All real numbers. Doesn't matter what. Pick one. Um, but in this problem, they give you a restriction right here. So they say it is only on the numbers from zero to two. So our domain here isn't all real numbers. It's the little section they restricted us to. Zero to two. Second part is a little bit harder. Range. Range is the possible Possible inputs, possible outputs. If you're looking at a graph, this is the x values that you can plug in. And this is the y values that you can get, the heights you can get. This one's a little bit harder because we need to actually look at the function and ask ourselves, how small can that be? And how big can that be? How small can it be? Four. Right. Yeah, four. The smallest it can be. For a minute, just think. How small can 5x squared be? You, you plug in a positive number and it you square it and it if it's a positive number bigger than one, it gets bigger, right? And then you multiply by five, so it gets bigger yet. You plug in a negative number less than negative one, and it becomes a positive number bigger than one. You multiply by five, and it gets bigger again. Between negative one and one, you square it and it gets smaller, but it's still positive, right? Multiply by five and you get a positive number that's less than five, right? But still positive. This can never be negative, no matter what you plug in. And the smallest this term can be is zero. This term is always four, so zero plus four is four. So our range has a lower value of four, and actually that's connected to this input. When x is zero, we get four. That's not always the case. Okay, sometimes the minimum value will be somewhere in this interval. It doesn't have to be at an endpoint. Uh, a nice little curve to Show you that would be this one. Say this is zero and this is two. This is a minimum height of one and I don't know, six up here. The minimum for this curve is actually in between zero and two. Now, how big can this get? 
in this interval, that's the number we're going to put here. What do you think? 24. How'd you get that? Yeah, yeah. He maximized this term and then it's at four. Right? Four doesn't change. So if you can make this one as big as possible, you're good. The way to do that is to pick this end point. Okay. All right, so 24. Perfect. Domain, zero to two, range four to twenty-four. Perfect. That's 54. I picked another one of something like this. I'm trying to see. Yeah, okay. I'm going to erase this and I'll put the next one right next to it. This one's 56 and it's very similar, but uh, it's the same question. Find the domain and range but it is a different function. It's one over three X six. Find the domain and range of this function. Anyone have any ideas? All real estate yeah, yeah. We can multiply any number by three, subtract six, but we have this problem with dividing by zero. So we get that when we have a two here. When we plug in two, we get one divided by zero. Issue, right? So the domain, we can write this a couple ways, is all reals slash Computer guys, is that backslash or forward slash? I don't even remember. It's the one you never use unless you're really like. <laughs> it's the one people rarely use. The reels without two. We can say it that way. We can say it like this. Negative infinity two together with two to infinity. Or we can put it in set builder notation, which is a set of all numbers x such that x is not equal to so, uh, Lots of ways we can say that. Now, how about the range? This is the tricky one. Just for a second, let me uh, rewrite this. I'm going to say this is 1 over a, where a is just 3x minus 6, OK? So we can compute a. That's not a problem. The form of this function is 1 divided by some number computed with 3x minus 6. I wanted to rewrite it this way so that you could think about this. This is a little easier. How big could you make this number by plugging in an A? How big? One divided by something. How? how? How can you make it infinite? How can you make it as big as you want? Yeah, how? How do you how do you do that? A, a thousand. Perfect. One over one thousand. Let me plug in. When you divide one by that, you get one thousand. 
Okay, how would you make it bigger? A million. Plug in a million. Perfect. What does that give you? A million. So if A gets closer and closer to zero, oh, I forget. I can write that there. Yeah. I can plug in A's closer and closer to zero, but on the positive side. Right? And this number just gets bigger and bigger and bigger in the positive direction. Right? Okay. Translate. Now we're not plugging in things close to zero. We're plugging in things close to. We want this to be close to zero, but just bigger. So what do we plug in? Something that's really close to two. Yes, but a little bit bigger, right? So then we get something closer and closer to six, but bigger than six. So that when we subtract six, we get something like a million. So that the result of the fraction is like huge. Perfect. Down here, what we're doing is we're plugging in numbers in this interval closer and closer and closer to two from the right side. And the result is we get this massive, 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 infinite progression of values. They grow and grow and grow forever. The closer we get to two on the right side, the larger it gets on the positive side. Okay, can we get something, can we make this as small as we want? Negative infinity on the flip side. Your idea was perfect. Approach the x value, which is not allowed. See what happens. Let's approach from the other direction. See what happens. Okay. And then we're gonna do some analysis of the thing to see if we missed anything. But for the most part here, we're gonna plug in numbers closer and closer to two, but on the other side. So instead of being bigger than two, we're gonna be just less than two. Like 1.9, for example. Three times 1.9, it's just less than six. So we subtract six, and we get one divided by a little bit, a, ne a little negative number, which results in a big negative number. Plug in 1.99, and you get something that's even closer to six, but smaller. So the difference is a negative number that's even smaller than before, which results in a fraction that's even bigger, but negative still than the previous one, right? So we can approach this way and we're going to get numbers that are progressively smaller and smaller and smaller. That makes sense. Yeah. Isn't it a fraction? So yeah. Would it, like, would, can't you, would it not be a go past one because it's one over whatever? So it's. You mean higher than one or lower than one? Is that what you're asking? Because whatever we, we put in for x, it would just make the denominator larger or smaller, meaning that. Couldn't go up, right? It could only be like one over like a million or a billion or a trillion. Yeah, okay. Yeah, here. So, uh, we, can, we can look at this table here. So, 
two, you know, nothing happens. But what about like uh, two point go with uh, two and a third. We do that. That's our input. What do we get with that? We get three times two and a third. That's six and one more, so that's seven. So this is one over one or two. What about two and one thirty? That gives us one over three times two, which is six, plus three times one thirtieth, which is one ten. So that's six and one ten minus six, which is one over one ten. If I kept going with this, two and one, three hundred. Two and one, three thousandths. We would see that this result turns into something just like this, but we're getting powers of ten down here and powers of ten over here. We should make this as large as we want. The next thing that I will do is I will answer your question. You said it, it can only be bigger than one, right? Is that what you're trying to get at here? We're going to plug in a negative, uh, a two value, something close to two, but it's going to be on the other side. So let's just go with one and two thirds. This is one third smaller than two, right? Um, so what do we get here? Three times this is three plus two, so that's five. So one over five minus six, which is one over negative one. Which is okay, now I'm gonna keep doing this. I'm gonna get closer to two, but in the negative side is what I'm trying to get up here, the negative side. I'm going to plug in one and, well, I'm going to plug in two minus one thirtieth. So that's one and 29 thirtieths. And we can do the same process. And what are we going to get? We're going to get a number that's really small after we multiply the three. Man, this is so much easier with calculators. Isn't that right? <laughs> but you're going to get a number that's really, really close to, uh, really, really close to. Three times this is three, and 29 thirtieths times three is 29. And so this is five and nine tenths. So one over five and nine tenths minus six. And that gives us. What's that? Sorry. Okay. Uh, that gives us one over negative one tenth because we're one tenth short of six. Which is, we can we can make this as small as we want. We just keep. Subtracting from two, a smaller number, one tenth, one thirtieth, one three hundredth, one three thousand, and we can make this as small as we want. So there's no upper bound to the, the size of, of this. We can make it as big as we want, and there's no lower bound to this. We can make it as small as we want. Okay? But is there a problem with any possible? Values in between. That's the trickier question. Is there some height that we will never achieve?
Any thoughts? And we'd like to just say negative infinity to infinity, all real numbers, right? Is that possible? Or is there something that we can't get? One, two, three of you have computers. Go ahead. Go to Desmos. and graph this thing. 1 over 3x minus 6. You're going to get something something that looks like this. to try and zero in on something here. If you were to graph this or a plot a million, trillion, billion, whatever, however many points, you would start to see a pattern. There's this height that is kind of unapproachable to this function. And it happens when we take a similar approach to what we just did, the approach of some value, but we never actually get it. Here, to get infinity and negative infinity, we approach two. What happens if we approach infinity and negative infinity? Have you graphed it? Saw you moving around. Did you graph it yet? Does it look like that? Cross a certain negative point. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, sure. I didn't draw the line. But it looks like that. Yeah. But it levels out, right? Zoom out. Does it, does it keep going down or does it level off? Yeah. The thing that we're, we're talking about here is something called n behavior. And it can help you fine tune your range. We're going to look at what happens f as x goes to plus or minus infinity. And we're going to use this to help us fine tune our results. So just take a look at this. Oh, did, did I? Yeah, okay, fine. We didn't write anything down. We're good. What happens is x goes to infinity here. This 3x is huge, right? Eventually, this 3x is just just, just, just dominant to this negative six, right? And the end result is something like one over a huge number, a huge positive number, right? Can we ever make this fraction zero? No. We can never make this fraction zero. That's not what this says, right? No matter how big a number we plug in, no matter how small a number we plug in, we can't make this zero. The graph jumps right over it. Jumps right over it. This dotted line is the x-axis. Our range needs to be divided up. You can 
can't actually get zero out of this thing. Okay. We can get really close in the end behavior. We can get as close to zero as we want by plugging in larger and larger and larger things or more and more and more negative things, but we'll never get to zero. Okay. This is a really good problem because this is the essence of calculus. It's this limiting process. Uh, it's, it's how do I find with, within some error, how do I find an input to get me a value? You take this limiting approach until you get within your accepted error. You've got this, this infinite precision process. How close do you want your function to be to zero? Well, you go, you know, you draw a little boundary around. How do you determine what to plug in in order to be that close to zero? Calculus will take you there. This is how far out you need to go in order to get something within one thousandth of an inch. Things like this. It's a great problem for getting at this limiting process. When we approach it to where we look at end behavior, this is great. All right. Next question I had. It's eight fifty-six. Next question I had was 60 and 64, which was more things like this. So we'll move on to the next section. And we'll actually get through all three sections today pretty well. The next section was 2.2 now. And I selected question 21 first. Um, section 2.2 .2 is graphing functions. Uh, 22, sorry, 21 is graph. Function C of C is one over E squared. How does it do the graph function? How does it do what it does? <laughs> yes, and you can do the same. So here we go. Let's pick a bunch of inputs. And so, the game that I commonly ask my three-year-old to do, I'll connect the dots. So what are your favorite inputs? We can do almost anything here. I like powers of 10. Powers of 10 are great because I can square them easily, I can multiply them easily, and I have no problem with those computations. So let's go with negative 100, negative 10, negative one, zero, come on power 10, we're gonna try it. One, 10, 100. What do we get? Negative 100, we get one, divided by negative 100 squared, which is one over a positive 10,000, which is as a decimal, perhaps, 10 hundreds, thousands, 10 thousands, and oh, 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 one. Negative 10, same thing. One over negative 10 squared is one over 100, which is 0.01. 0 
negative 1. 1 over negative 1 squared is 1 over, uh, 1, over 1, which is 1. 0, that's an issue. Undefined. Something happens there. 10, we're going to get the same thing. The negative sign didn't matter at all, so we're going to get the exact same thing. And 100, we're going to get the same as that. Because that negative sign didn't matter at all. We squared it, it went away. Uh, and I didn't plug in 1, and I got kind of got off here. So let me plug in 1 here, we get 1. Now this graph will look a little bit wonky if you just play the connect the dots game. So we've got negative 100. At negative 100, we had 0.0001, just above the axis. At negative 10, we had 0.01, just above the axis. At negative 1, we had a height of 1. Zero, who knows? 10, same thing here, same thing up here, and same thing here. This isn't too bad. We've got six points. And if you connect the dots, you'll actually have something that's pretty close. But you need to be careful when you're connecting all dots. When you have things like this in graphs, where there's some undefined location, don't connect the dots between them. Old graphing calculators used to do this. Did you ever use the TI-83, Mr. Howell? Do you remember when you would plot things like 1 over x and it would give you those vertical lines? Old graphing calculators used to do things like this. If the graph was like this, and then like this, but it did not cross the gap ever, your calculator would still cross the gap for you. It would draw a line, just like that for you. It's an artifact of the calculator's method for graphing. Not really there. So, if you want to be like a TI-83 calculator, connect the dot. But, you can be better than a TI-83. I know you can be. Because you know that something weird is happening in between. There's this undefined value of zero. So you, what you need to do is that same limiting approach that we just talked about in the last problem. Get closer and closer and closer to zero and find out what happens there. Be a little curious, right? So let's make a secondary table here. Just something that's really close to zero and we'll figure out what happens. We'll still use powers of 10. Let's use 110. That's pretty close to zero, right? What happens when you square 110? You get 100. 1 over 100 1 over is 100. Okay, I don't think we need to go much further. We plug in a 10. Something that's really close to zero here. We could get closer. Plug in 100, plug in 1,000, plug whatever you want. But you get close one tenth already, and where is the graph? Up here somewhere. That's pretty much what happened on the right side. It's a bit smoother of a curve. In reality, it's a bit of a bend there instead of a sharp corner, right? But that's pretty much it. We could plug in more. We'll leave it. Let's plug some in that are just smaller than zero. Negative 110. We're going to get again 100. Yeah. Square it to get 1 100. 
divide and get 100. So again, it's over here. That's a pretty good graph. Okay, it's not perfect. Again, it's a bit smoother on the left side and the right side, but it's a pretty good estimation already. So the key point when graphing functions is make a table, right? That's all you need to do is make a table with the caveat of be careful of undefined values. When you come across things like division by zero or square roots of negatives, you need to inspect a little closer. Plug in a couple points closer to those undefined values, like we did here, and figure out the behavior of the function at those undefined values. Because nothing is happening there at that value. But interesting things can happen right around it, like you saw here. Things just blow up. And the margin here, that's not very big. That's a total separation of two here, right? So you go within this, and suddenly you've got massive values. You go outside of it, and you get nothing. I mean, I think about situations like that in, in life where, you know, you act normal, you do the usual thing, and not much happens, right? But there's like this small little zone, this small little space of decisions you can make or things you can do where the consequences suddenly explode, right? That's, that's what you need to inspect here. When you come across an undefined value, you need to inspect it a little bit more to see what happens. Okay, tease it out a little bit. Oh, next problem I had was 40. 40 was graphing a piecewise function. And I picked one that we can do rather quickly but I wanted to, to show you what a piecewise graph looks like. Remember, piecewise are the ones, the functions that have multiple rules, multiple options. Flip sign down. I did. Okay, so this graph is going to have three distinct parts because this piecewise function has three distinct rules. Right? The, the function's value is negative one if x is less than negative. It's one if x is bigger than positive one. And anywhere in between, the rule is x. We could still plug in a table of values and graph this. We, should, we still could do that. Okay, so that, that is always your fallback. I would also, I would definitely point out you should plug in these numbers and figure out what happens exactly at the boundaries of your rules. Those are the things you need to tease out. And then you should plug in a few values in every single zone to figure out what the graph of each zone looks like. So it's a little different than a normal function plot. It just has multiple plots in it. So what does this look like without all of that? So here's our, our x, y axis. I'm going to divide it up, negative 1, 1. And uh, a height of one and a height of negative one here. If I were to plug in anything from negative one to the left, our function's rule is negative one. So no matter what I plug in over here, I'm always going to get negative one. Any number I plug in in my table less than negative one gives me negative one all the way up to negative one, right? 
over here, the graph is like that. For anything that I plug in less than negative one, the rule is the output is negative one, the height is negative one. Constant. At negative one, that's not what happens. So I'm going to have a little circle there, open circle. Because at negative one, the rule changes from this to this. Let's see what happens when we plug in this boundary negative one. Oh, wouldn't you know? It's negative one. Fill that circle in. Okay, this one's nice. The parts are actually connected. Nice signal function here. The equation x, this rule, you know what that looks like. It's just a straight line with the slope of one. So I'm just going to plot that. That rule ends when x gets as big as 1. And then we switch to this third rule. So at x equals 1 here, we switch to this constant rule of a height of 1. Any number you plug in out here, they all give you the same height of 1. There it is. That's more or less the exact function you use in neural networks. All right. Machine learning, here we go. It's called an activation function. Usually it stops here or this whole thing is shifted up, but that's more or less what's happening behind the scenes. Questions on piecewise functions. They don't always have to be connected like this. But one thing that does usually happen is for every rule you have, you have a pretty distinct set of graphs. Okay. Three rules, three distinct graphs. And then each graph is within its own little zone of the input space. Okay. Next question was, 51. Ah, uh, 51. Is something called the vertical line test. Um, and it's asking four parts. Determine which of these is a function and which of these is not a function by the vertical line test. So A and B, there we go. You're the students. Help me out. What's the vertical line test for? Oh, perfect. So, it, yeah, here's the x axis. If I draw a vertical line to this one, I notice for this one x value, I get this and this output, right? What does that mean? That means this is not a function, right? Oh man, how many of you order things from vending machines? Yeah, oh yeah, yeah, you know what I'm talking about. Okay, so you walk up to the vending machine and you press, of course, Pepsi, right? Because you want Pepsi, right? Well, what if when you press that Pepsi, instead of getting exactly the one choice you wanted, the vending machine had a mind of its own and was like, hmm, Pepsi or Coke? Maybe I'll give him, like, maybe this time I'll give him Coke, Coca Cola, you know? You see, two possibilities, and it's choosing between the two. That's not, that's not what you want. That's not a function machine. A vending machine is a function machine. For the one input, you get a specific output. What you choose is what you get. What is this? This is. I choose this X and out pops this and this, maybe either one in some maybe weird way. This is not a function because for the one input, there's two outputs. Okay, when you think of a function, you should be thinking vending machine. For the input, there's only one output. How about this one? 
Is it a function? Yeah. No matter what x you choose, there's only ever one output. Okay, no matter which x you choose. So yes, this is a function, no, this is not a function, or the graph of a function, I should say. P and D are curves like this. Okay, I think it's pretty obvious. C. Is it a function or no? Yeah, yeah, pretty much. You might argue that my graph kind of curves back over here, but maybe you can't see that because of the light. Uh, there you go, yeah, now it's definitely a function. No vertical line crosses this graph at more than one place. Right? All right, so it's a function. Part D, it's a rectangle, which is beautiful in its own right, but it's definitely not a function. I mean, this vertical line touches an infinite number of points all along that edge. That's a terrible vending machine. It invents new flavors for you. That's like you go up to those smart machines, you know, and you can select every little flavor you want, but it just keeps making up new ones and it chooses for you. Oh, that's bad. Oh. Chocolate flavored Pepsi. Oh, that'd be a bad idea. Okay, uh, next problem. I had 54. Oh, there's another vertical line test. We're going to skip that. It was with an oval, so not a function, right? An oval, not a function. Uh, 67 and 68. Three minutes. We'll do both of them. This is great. The question is, now without a graph, are these functions, is, uh, I guess maybe I should be more explicit, does it say this in the instructions? Yep. Okay, determine if y is a function get there with equations instead of graphs. You have to what? You have to isolate y. So it would be by computer graphs. Yes, exactly. Yeah. In his terms, you have to isolate the y. You have to uh, unravel what this is so that it's solved for just y, not y cubed. And he's also right in what he does. Take the cube group of both sides. Right? Okay. Is that a function of x? For every input x, is there only one possible output y? There's a bit of a skill to this. Does it make it come like plus or minus? Does it, uh... Yeah, but it's an odd root, right? There he's right. He remembers something about 
odd, even roots, and maybe there's pluses and minuses. See, with odd roots, there's no plus or minus. This is what it is. Y is the third root of X. Okay. If I now plug in a specific X, is there any way I'm going to get close enough, smooth, go, smooth, go? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, man. Right, this one, though. I could change it, make it easier. What happens now when you take that square root? Minus, right? Right? Okay, so think about what this says. X is the square of something. Okay. So when we do this, we're going to get Y is plus or minus square root of X. Right? We can either if I fix an x value, like 10, I can either plug in the positive square root of 10 and square it, or I can plug in the negative square root of 10 and square it. Right? For my 1x, I have two possible outputs, plus or minus root 10. Right? Now let's not make it as simple as that. Put it back to the problem at hand. The building's falling apart, apparently. <laughs> what do you think? Plus or minus still there? make it easier. Let's take an input X as one. What numbers can you raise to the fourth power and get one? One works. One to any powers, one. So. One works. What that means is we have a pair one and one on our graph. So one works. Okay, what else? Negative one still works. Yes. The question was is that plus or minus still there, right? The answer is yes still there. When you take negative one to the fourth power, you still have one, which means we still have this second order pair. For one, we also have negative one as a y. Right there, we've located two outputs for one input x. Moral of the story is for odd roots, you don't have to worry about plus or minuses. For even roots, you do. Okay. All right. That's it. It's 9.24. I kept you long. Sorry about that. Um, thanks for coming. Thanks for attending online. Um, I will see you guys tomorrow in office hours if you need it. Homework for 1, 11, 2, 1, and 2, 2 are due Friday. On Monday, there's a quiz on those three as well. I think in is it two or three weeks now, we've got the first test coming up, right? Yeah, it's something like this, two weeks maybe. I'll, I'll say two, but it might be three. Two weeks, we've got a test coming up. And uh, 
it's on chapters one and two. It'll be on WebAssign. Um, you'll have just like the quiz is a 24 hour period to take it, but it'll be timed to an hour and 20 minutes. So instead of having a 10 minute quiz, you'll have an hour and 20 minute test. Um, and uh, there will be no quiz that day. Okay, so it replaces the quiz altogether. All right, so thanks for coming. It's great to see you all. Stay safe out there. Thanks for attending online, everyone. The video will be up in a couple hours. I don't know if the video quality improved, but um, I hope it did.